Perhaps more than any other skin condition, I get so many requests to talk about melasma. So today we're going through melasma, what it is, and what you can do to make it better. If you're new here, thanks for stopping by. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis, and I'm a board certified medical and cosmetic dermatologist in Northern California. I'm here to help you understand your skin and find products that work for you. So if that sounds good, give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I would describe melasma as a skin condition in which someone develops somewhat symmetrical hyperpigmented patches that typically show up on the face, but can show up on other areas of the body as well, like the neck and the arms. And hyperpigmentation really just means discoloration that is darker than your natural skin tone. And melasma can look brown, but it can also look gray or even bluish in color. The other thing worth noting is melasma is completely asymptomatic, meaning it's not itchy, it's not painful. You can see it, but you should not be able to feel it. And although any adult can technically get melasma, it is much, much more commonly seen in women, and it is much more commonly seen in women who have deeper skin tones. As someone who personally struggles with melasma, I think one of the most frustrating things about it is that it seemingly comes out of nowhere. You're just going along, minding your own business, and then one day you wake up with these dark patches on your forehead or your cheeks or your upper lip and you're sitting around going, what happened here? So let's talk about causes of melasma. I should also mention, first of all, for most people who develop melasma, they are genetically predisposed, meaning that there is something in their DNA programmed from birth that allows them to be susceptible to certain melasma triggers. For example, we know that UV light or UV radiation is one of the main drivers of melasma. However, not everyone that's exposed to sunlight gets melasma and the people that that do are genetically predisposed. In addition to UV light, we also know that blue light, which sits very close on the electromagnetic spectrum to UV light, but is part of the visible light spectrum, can also trigger melasma in certain populations. And if you have any questions about blue light and hyperpigmentation, I have an entire YouTube video about it. Aside from other types of light exposure, we also know that when you have hormonal shifts, principally increased levels of estrogen and progesterone, you are much more likely to develop melasma. This is why a lot of women will report that their first melasma flare happened after they started on an oral contraceptive pill or when they got pregnant. Melasma is also known as the mask of pregnancy. And whether you're on an OCP or you get pregnant, your estrogen and progesterone levels go up, 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 and your pigmentation kind of follows that. A lot of people don't realize that progesterone therapy on its own, like the mini pill or a hormonal IUD, such as the Skyla or the Mirena, can also cause melasma. And then probably just over the last few years, I'm seeing a lot more women in their 50s and 60s coming in with new melasma flares. And it's because they've started on hormone replacement therapy or menopausal hormone therapy. Another melasma trigger is heat. So things like hot yoga or regular sauna use, those can trigger melasma. And the reason for that is we used to think melasma was exclusively a disorder of pigmentation, but we've now realized that there's this vascular component or this component that is driven by the blood vessels. And when your body heats up, the blood vessels in the surface of your skin dilate or open up. And when that happens, it can make your melasma worse for some people. So when I'm counseling my melasma patients, in clinic, those are the four main drivers of melasma that we talk about. Genetics, UV exposure, hormone shifts, and heat. But there are other things that can drive melasma, like certain medications that make you more sensitive to the sun, and other genetic conditions. For example, we know that people who have autoimmune thyroid disorders are much more likely to develop melasma. As with most things in medicine, there's a lot about melasma that we still probably don't understand. So we will understand the drivers of melasma as well as the treatments more as time goes on and further research is done. The reason I think it's so important to review the causes of melasma before we discuss treatment is because a lot of the treatments have to do with intervening on those causes or those triggers. Now, of course, we cannot change your genetic code, but we can look at your UV exposure and your other lifestyle factors, as well as your hormonal influences, and decide whether or not we want to intervene on those in order to reduce your melasma. And the reason I say decide is because you don't have to treat your melasma, though I'm guessing because you're watching this video, you want to treat your melasma or you want to help someone else with their melasma. But doing that often requires some significant lifestyle changes. And it can be really frustrating that this is the case, but because melasma is so exquisitely sensitive to its triggers and it is incredibly stubborn or hard to get rid of, you have to really think about how you're going to dedicate yourself to improving your melasma, whether that's significantly changing your UV exposure or changing up your hobbies or changing your hormonal treatments of whatever they may be. You might have to make more than one sacrifice in order to get your skin better. And you might be 
watching this right now going, oh my gosh, Dr. Ellis, you are so incredibly negative. Why can't you be like my little melasma cheerleader? And I want to be your melasma cheerleader. I want your melasma to get better, but I want to also be realistic about how you go about doing that because you can do all the topical treatments for melasma in the world and all the oral treatments. But if you are still exposing yourself to melasma triggers, it's going to be so incredibly hard to treat. For example, if you're on some type of hormonal therapy, like a birth control pill, and you come in and we're talking about melasma and ways to improve it, the first thing we're going to talk about is coming off of that birth control pill and shifting you to some other type of contraception. And the reason for that is that contraceptive pill is driving your melasma and trying to reverse your melasma while still being on that medication is like trying to hit the brakes while still pushing the gas. It's just not effective. The other thing I'll say about melasma and managing and treating melasma is that it's a chronic condition. It always wants to be there. So if you're on melasma therapy and you're seeing good results, you generally need to continue treatment or be on some type of melasma maintenance plan in order to keep your results, which conveniently brings me to my next point, melasma results. What should you be looking for when you're treating your melasma? And I find that a lot of people are really hoping that their skin goes back to completely clear as if they had never had a melasma flare ever once in their life. And the reality is our goal is to reduce the dispigmentation or reduce the hyperpigmentation on your face. Oftentimes we are never able to get you fully back to your baseline. Occasionally that happens and that is so exciting when it does, but the expectation really should be to reduce the melasma severity, not eliminate it entirely. Now, sometimes for some blessed people, melasma just goes away on its own, especially when you remove the trigger. So your pregnancy is done. You don't have that surge of progesterone and estrogen anymore. And your melasma naturally fades over time. Same with coming off of a birth control pill. Some people's melasma will naturally go away, but for a lot of people, it won't even when that trigger has been removed from the situation. And that's when introducing treatments are really meaningful when you're no longer triggering your melasma and you're ready to treat it. The last thing I'll say before we delve into specific melasma treatments is that when you're going to treat your melasma, it can be very helpful to connect with a dermatologist first. One, we can help guide you towards the most effective treatments. And two, we can make sure that the pigmentation that you're treating is actually melasma. There are so many other disorders of hyperpigmentation on the face that can mimic melasma. And you really wanna make sure you're treating the right thing before you invest that time and money and effort. The number one treatment for melasma is sunscreen and sun protection. Literally, if you do nothing else, this will help your melasma. And I really want to underscore the value of sun protection beyond sunscreen. Now I know this is a skincare channel. We'll definitely talk about some sunscreens that I really, really like, but staying out of midday sun, wearing a broad brim hat. These are really, really important things that make a huge difference as well. I want to make this point abundantly clear. And that is if you have melasma, a baseball cap is not going to cut it. You need a wide brim hat that has 360 degree coverage. I generally look for a rim that's three and a half inches or broader. And I get it. It can be really hard to find a cute hat that fits that criteria. When it comes to like adventure hats, I really like the brand Sunday Afternoons. REI also has some great hiking hats that have wider brims. And then when it comes to more stylish hats or ones that you'd like wear in public, I really love Eric Javits and Janessa Leone. Yes, those are investments, but a great protective sun hat is worth it. Now, when it comes to sunscreens and melasma, I generally like SPF 50 or higher. Now, if you have an SPF 30 sunscreen that you absolutely love and wear consistently, that's totally fine. And even though the difference in UV protection between SPF 30 and SPF 50 is pretty minimal, when you have an exquisitely sun sensitive condition like melasma, I tend to lean people towards the SPF 50 if they're able to. Now, I do think there is one major misconception when it comes to melasma and sunscreen, and that is the thought that physical sunscreens or sunscreens that only have zinc oxide and or titanium dioxide as their filters are superior to quote unquote chemical sunscreens when you have melasma. And that is simply not the case. So if you prefer using a sunscreen that has some chemical filters, go for it. Don't feel bad about it. It is just as protective as a physical sunscreen. The most important thing when it comes to SPF is just finding one that you like, that you enjoy, and that you will apply and reapply consistently. Now, one thing that might actually be worth looking for is a sunscreen that is tinted because tinted sunscreens contain an ingredient called iron oxides and iron oxides are protective from blue light. And if you remember in the beginning of this video, I talked about how some people's melasma will be triggered by not only UV exposure, but also blue light exposure. At this point in time, research has really only shown blue light as being problematic for those with deeper skin tones. So if you have a deeper skin tone, having a tinted sunscreen that offers some blue light protection may afford you additional benefits. If you're looking for some sunscreen recommendations, I have several videos on this channel that you should check out that 
that are dedicated to my sunscreen favorites. One that I haven't talked that much about, but that I really love is the SkinCeuticals Physical Fusion. This is SPF 50 and it's just a wonderful luminous tinted sunscreen. My patients with sensitive skin in particular really love this one. And this is actually the sunscreen we apply to the patients in our office after we perform resurfacing procedures like chemical peels or lasers. Another sunscreen that I've absolutely been loving lately is the EV Technology Daily Defense Mousse, which is also SPF 50. So this is a Swedish sunscreen and it's actually formulated as a foam. So it's a little bit different to apply than your standard lotion or cream sunscreen, but it's sort of claim to fame is that it is very long lasting on the skin and highly water resistant. So if you're someone who really struggles with reapplying their sunscreen and you really should be doing that if you have melasma or even if you don't, this might be a great sunscreen option for you. Okay, hopefully I have really driven that sun protection point home when it comes to melasma. Let's talk about other topical ingredients that can be helpful and also some products that incorporate those ingredients. So ingredient number one is iron oxides, which I already sort of touched on when I was talking about tinted sunscreens and that blue light protection that iron oxides afford you. And they're not just found in tinted sunscreens. They're also found in foundations and concealers. So if you cannot find a tinted sunscreen that you absolutely love, then it's totally fine to use a regular sunscreen that's not tinted and then apply foundation or concealer on top to give you that iron oxide exposure and that added blue light protection. Next up is the gold standard ingredient when treating melasma or even other types of hyperpigmentation. And that is hydroquinone. Hydroquinone works by inhibiting your pigment producing cells in your body, your melanocytes, from being able to make melanin, which is what gives your skin pigment. Sometimes creams that contain hydroquinone are referred to as bleaching creams, but I feel like that name is really misleading. You are not bleaching the skin. You're just reducing the skin's ability to generate excess melanin. Hydroquinone used to be available over the counter in low percentage strengths, but that has since been banned in the United States. And if you've gone to a drugstore and found hydroquinone, it really shouldn't be there. It should only be available via prescription. Now, some people see this transition of hydroquinone being an over-the-counter product to a prescription only product and go, oh my gosh, does that mean it's not safe? No, it doesn't mean that it's unsafe. It just means that it is a drug that requires additional regulation in order to be prescribed properly and that people who are on it should be under the guidance of someone who really understands the risks and benefits of that ingredient. Hydroquinone can also be formulated and prescribed in ways that will influence its efficacy. For example, you can get 4% hydroquinone, but you can also get 12% hydroquinone. It can also be compounded with other ingredients that help fight melasma, which is usually what I do in my own practice. And all of those things will influence how well you respond to it. Because sometimes I have patients who come in who are like, hydroquinone doesn't work for me. And then I find out they've only tried 4% hydroquinone on its own and they weren't doing that great of sun protection. So every little bit, every little variable makes a difference. Now, if you're hydroquinone curious, but you're not quite ready to go there, you might want to try something like Arbutin. Arbutin is a hydroquinone derivative and is found in a lot of skincare products that are available without prescriptions. One thing I did not mention is I would not recommend using hydroquinone during pregnancy or while breastfeeding. It can be absorbed into your bloodstream. And although that has not shown to cause any type of health consequence, we just don't know. So I'd rather err on the side of caution. Now, Arbutin is a little bit of a different story. It is a derivative of hydroquinone, but it's not nearly as potent, nor is it absorbed systemically as much as hydroquinone is. So when people ask me, well, can I use Arbutin when I'm pregnant or breastfeeding? I would say talk to your OBGYN. I personally used Arbutin during my pregnancy though. Another great skincare ingredient that helps fight melasma is azelaic acid. Azelaic acid has so many wonderful benefits for the skin, but one thing it can do is help brighten the skin and reduce hyperpigmentation. There are even some studies that show that prescription strength azelaic acid, which is 15 to 20%, is as effective as some strengths of hydroquinone. I think one of the great things about azelaic acid is that it is safe in pregnancy and while breastfeeding. And although I don't think you are going to make great strides in reversing your melasma during that time in your life, it can help keep your pigmentation at bay. Let's move on to some more ingredients. Tretinoin, which is a prescription strength retinoid, has also been shown to improve the appearance of melasma. Now, if you do not have access to prescription tretinoin, or if you can't tolerate tretinoin because it causes too much irritation, you can try adapalene instead. Adapalene is a third generation retinoid. It's available over the counter. It's less irritating and has also been shown to help with melasma. Physicians who treat a lot of hyperpigmentation and melasma in their clinics will often compound tretinoin with hydroquinone and then often also with a mild steroid to help with any irritation that those two ingredients can cause. And that is applied topically either twice a day or once a day, usually for several months. And that can help a lot with someone's pigmentation. Now we don't want someone on that combination forever. So once someone has improvement, we typically have them take a break and then go on maintenance therapy of 
some kind. Now, there are certainly other skincare ingredients that also help with hyperpigmentation and are available in over-the-counter skincare formulations. And I always think of those as sort of a complement to any prescription strength melasma therapy. So ingredients that I look for are things like kojic acid, tranexamic acid, niacinamide, L-ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C and licorice root extract. Ooh, another topical ingredient that I forgot to mention is cysteamine. It's probably more commonly known as cispera, but this also can really help with hyperpigmentation. It's usually formulated as a product that you leave on for 15 minutes or so and then rinse off once a day. And I think of that again as a complement to any other prescription melasma therapy. Okay, let's talk about some products that incorporate a lot of these ingredients. And the first one up is called Meladerm. Now, if you watched my other video on ingredients that help fight hyperpigmentation, I also talked about this product in that video. Of any hyperpigmentation fighting product that's available without prescription, this one is probably my favorite. It has just such a great combination of pigment fighting ingredients. It has vitamin C and licorice root extract and kojic acid and azelaic acid and some other proprietary skin brighteners. And I just find that if a patient does not want to be on hydroquinone or can't be on hydroquinone for some reason, or same with tretinoin, they're not using them or they don't want to, this is a great alternative. If you're interested in trying a melasma topical that has cysteamine, and I don't think I mentioned this before, but cysteamine is an antioxidant and it really helps brighten the skin, then I recommend trying the one by Senti. It's their pigment and tone corrector. Now, of course, not every melasma product is going to work for every person who has melasma, but if it's something you've been battling for a while and you're looking for new things to try, I think this one might be worthwhile. And no matter what you're using to treat your melasma, whether it's prescription strength topicals or oral medication or skincare alone, you have to be combining that with excellent sun protection. I know I sound like a broken record bringing up the point of sun protection and sunscreen, but it is so essential to getting your melasma better. Okay, we are almost done with this video, but I do wanna take a second to talk about oral treatments for melasma because it's actually probably the most common way that I treat melasma in my own practice. People who are really familiar with treating disorders of hyperpigmentation are very familiar with the concept of topical tranexamic acid, but a lot of people don't know that you can take it orally and it can be very, very effective for melasma. I prescribe this medication pretty much every single day in my practice, and I have seen women who have struggled with their melasma for years, have not responded to any topicals or have responded very minimally, and their melasma almost completely clears on this medication. Now, I don't want to make oral tranexamic acid sound like a miracle cure for everyone who has melasma. It certainly has risks and benefits, and if you want me to talk more in depth about oral tranexamic acid, I'm happy to do so. Just let me know in the comments. There's also an oral supplement called Polypodium leucotomos, which is derived from a fern. Maybe you've heard of it. It's also known as Heliocare. And this is really an antioxidant that helps with UV damage, and there are some clinical trials that show that it is helpful for people who struggle with melasma. Now, there are also some clinical trials that show that it's not helpful, but it has always been deemed as safe. So it's something that might be worth trying if you're looking to supplement your melasma care in other ways. Another oral supplement that may be helpful for melasma is oral glutathione. There are some small studies that show that it helps with skin brightening, but it has not really been proven to be consistently effective for melasma. It doesn't mean that it's not, it just means we don't have the evidence there yet. So it's not something that I regularly recommend. Before I end this video, I did wanna to touch on the value of in-office procedures for the treatment of melasma. And the reason I'm not dedicating a ton of time to talking about this is because I don't find them to be incredibly valuable. The reason for that is melasma tends to come back no matter what you do, whether you do a VI peel or a Cosmolon peel or other chemical peel or laser resurfacing, that's never really a permanent solution for your melasma. Nothing's really a permanent solution for your melasma. So rather than have my patients invest lots of money in procedures, I tend to focus on medical management, whether that's with topical treatments or oral treatments. Now I should clarify, I perform procedures like chemical peels and laser resurfacing on my melasma patients all the time in my practice, but the main goal is not to address their melasma. People with melasma can have other skin concerns, whether it's acne scarring or dullness or fine lines and wrinkles, just general anti-aging concerns. And so there are treatments that are safe for people with melasma. And if you want an entire breakdown of that, let me know in the comments, but I can do clear and brilliant lasers and microneedling and certain types of chemical peels, but I never promise permanent reduction in melasma for those patients. We're doing it for other reasons. And if it happens to temporarily help their melasma, that's also great. And I think with that, we will end this video. Now I'm curious, have you tried any products or treatments that have been effective for your melasma? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.